specific issues such as transitional justice, uh, truth commission, uh, the reincorporation of the FARC, negotiations with the ELN and academic research and policy impact. And um, today's event has been very kindly organized by the transitional justice team in particular. Um, and uh, this is going to be a really um, exciting dialogue and very timely and it's going to be chaired by Andre Gomez Suarez, our member and also researcher associate at the University of Bristol and I'll hand over him to him in a moment. Um, but I just wanted to share with you all the six principles that we have adopted as part of our culture of dialogue and um, we would like to invite you to incorporate these principles into how we're going to have um, this dialogue today, uh, but also perhaps think about them a bit more broadly as principles that can help guide us also on this um, sensitive and important issue of reparations uh, to victims of armed conflict. So those six principles are first and foremost solidarity, which perhaps is the most um, obviously relevant for the topic of discussion. Uh, and we understand it to mean the ability to put ourselves in the shoes of others. Honesty, being able to say what we truly think without fear of being um, stigmatized or reproached for our viewpoint. Respect, understanding that other people will have um, different opinions, but that we can uh, perhaps disagree with their ideas, but still respect them as human beings. Um, and also respect for the time of others. And um, in this dialogue, there's many of us in this space and hopefully we'll all have a chance to uh, speak up and, and ask our questions if we want to, but we should do that respecting um, the time so that everyone can have that opportunity. Generosity, we ask that you give the best of yourself for the next uh, two hours um, and really be present in this space so that we can receive all um, the best of everyone participating here. Self-criticism, because nobody knows all of the answers and we all have an opportunity through dialogue to uh, revise our um, received uh, perspectives and perhaps challenge them and learn from other people's views who think differently. And finally, co-responsibility. Uh, we believe that we are all responsible together for um, building a better Colombia and a better world. Um, and perhaps particularly timely principles to consider as principles of action at a time in which action is deeply needed um, across the world as uh, all of the events in the US and more widely have been um, pointing to us that action is needed, not just words. And finally, you can find out more information about the work that we do um, at our UK website, uk.rodemoseldialogo.org. And I'll now hand over to Andre to introduce the speakers and chair the discussion. Thank you, Andre. Thank you, Gwen, and thank you everyone for uh, coming to this important event. I would like to start by thanking in particular the transitional justice team of Rodemos el Dialogo, Obed, Laura Chaparro, and Germán, Otalora, who have been really supportive in trying to make all this run smoothly and to let you know that uh, of this uh, discussion that we will have today, we will do a short publication for uh, our broader audience in Colombia to, to read the important uh, comments that we are going to hear here today. Second, I want to thank uh, the, the SOAS Center for Conflict Rights Justice uh, and the Transitional Justice Network at Essex for joining in this partnership and making this happen in such an important discussion today. Um, I would like to uh, offer first the, 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 to you all the participants the way how we are going to run the event today. So what we wanna try to do is to have an interactive dialogue between first our speakers, and then uh, we want to open up the floor for the comments and questions from the participants here in, 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 in this uh, webinar. Um, so we first uh, will ask some questions uh, uh, to our guest speakers. Uh, we think that that first part would probably take up to 45 minutes. And then we will open to rounds of questions in which you will be invited to either do your questions um, 
uh, turning on your microphones and asking the question or making the comment. Or if you prefer, you could also write some questions on our chat uh, so that we will be able to pass those questions on to our speakers. Now, before we start, I would like to share with you the reason why we thought this event was so important and what motivated this, uh, this invitation that we have done to discuss reparations in the world. We have heard uh, that Colombia is regarded by many analysts as the most comprehensive system in reparations of reparations in the world. Uh, but we are concerned that uh, after the 2016 peace agreement with the FARC, the violence continues in Colombia. And we, were, we wonder how is it possible to talk about reparations in the middle of uh, an armed conflict or in the middle of violence. So we thought that it was a good idea to take a stoke, both of what was happening in Colombia, why Colombia is considered the most comprehensive approach to reparations, but also what are the developments in the world and whether it is really, if, and whether if it is the case that Colombia is the most comprehensive system in the world. So we thought that this would allow us also to start thinking about the role that art has been playing in reparations. So it was important to start thinking about those elements too. And we wanted to get a sense of what's happening both in Colombia and elsewhere. And because of that, we are gonna have this panel that today will help us probably answer some of these questions that we had, but also probably will leave new questions open for all of us to continue thinking about reparations. So without further ado, what I would like to, to ask is our first uh, speaker is to ask Phil Clark, who is a professor of international politics at SOAS, uh, to give us a first sort of account of feel what's happening in terms of reparations in the last few years uh, in, in, in the broad picture of the world. Great. Um, thanks so much, Andre. Uh, thanks to um, Redimos here, Dialogo and Essex and Bristol for hosting, I think, this very important discussion at a, a very important time. Obviously, the focus of our discussion today is going to be reparations in the Colombian context. Um, what I want to do very briefly just to set the scene is, is give a sense of the international terrain uh, around reparations uh, at the moment. One of the best places that we can start in trying to understand this international context, I, I think, is the, uh, the reparations responsibility and victimhood in transitional societies project at, at Queen's University Belfast. And I'm conscious that we've got Luke Moffat uh, in our group of participants um, today. L L Luke and his colleagues, I think, uh, really have one of the, the best international resources on trying to understand the breadth of reparations uh, processes uh, around the world. Uh, if you look at their reparations database, they've got information there on no fewer than 70 different countries around the world that have some form of, of reparations um, program. Th that immediately, I think, gives us a sense of just how broad and how uh, international and how diverse uh, debates about reparations uh, really are. W what I want to do in, in this uh, presentation is just sketch what I see as some of the recurring issues and, and recurring tensions in reparations debates uh, around the world and, and give a couple of concrete examples that hopefully flesh out some issues that we can then attach to the, the Colombian discussions um, with uh, Clara and, and with Luis Carlos uh, in, in just a moment. But I think if we're going to talk about reparations today, it, it, it's very difficult to go past um, the, the US context that Gwen referred to in, in her comments. I think this is a, a perfect starting place for our discussions uh, today. If, if we think about just what has happened in the US uh, in the last few days after the police killing of, of George Floyd, um, we, we get a real insight into what's at stake in, in our discussions about reparations because the, the, the killing of Floyd and, and the subsequent protests in the US and around the world have really put this huge spotlight on issues of, around violence, uh, around uh, systemic inequality suffered by 
African Americans. From the period of slavery onwards, uh, this entire history of compounding injustices at, at every level of American society. Clearly, these protests in the last few days have, have been about the killing of George Floyd and, and other African Americans in the last uh, few days, but, but there's this much larger historical context that obviously fuels uh, the, the deep sense of, of rage um, and injustice uh, that's being expressed at the moment. And I think it's, it's with all of that in mind that I, in preparation for today's discussion, I went back and looked at um, Ta-Nehisi Coates's very um, widely publicized piece in the Atlantic magazine in 2014 entitled uh, The Case for Reparations. Uh, Coates's article really rekindled crucial debates uh, in the US about the need to address uh, the legacies of slavery uh, and subsequent uh, degradation um, and marginalization of African Americans and, and the various legacies that stem from the period of, of slavery in, in particular. And it should be said, even though Coates doesn't uh, acknowledge it in his own piece, um, his argument about the need for reparations in the US context was building on this enormous literature um, by US academics around the need for reparations um, by the likes of William Darity at, at Duke uh, and others. But the crux of Coates's, ar Coates's argument, I think is really important for our discussions today. He really argues in this piece that debates about reparations in the US context and elsewhere get too bogged down in exactly who, especially in individual terms, is expected to benefit from reparations programs and how much will they cost. And what is missed, Coates argues, is the need to focus much more fundamentally on structural reparations. Reparations that are geared towards addressing deep societal harm. He thinks that there is too much emphasis on individual payments, issues of handouts, and what there needs to be in debates about reparations is a real sense of national reckoning with the harms of the past. At one point in that article, he begs the question, what, it, what would be required to close the wealth gap, especially between white and African-American populations? And he argues that in order to answer that question, there's going to have to be, quote, the cooperation of every aspect of American society. That in order to deliver reparations in a meaningful, in a just, and in an honest way, to use Gwen's word, this is going to involve uh, comprehensive redress, that reparations in the US context, he argues, is going to mean addressing issues around employment, around healthcare, around housing, around education, around policing, around voting rights, and, and, and an innumerable list of uh, societal uh, dimensions. And so I think what is crucial in Coates's work and, and reflecting on that in light of what's happening in the US at the moment, is the scope of reparations. Um, and especially this idea of reparations needing to have a deep structural component. So against this US backdrop, let me just give some brief comments on what's happening in the rest of the world. Um, what are some of the key debates that are happening in the international context? I think what is useful about Coates's argument and his call for structural reparations is that this meshes very strongly with debates that are going on in transitional justice. And I know that uh, many of you who are attending today uh, work in the field of transitional justice. In this field, many debates have started to head in the direction of what is now called transformative justice. And I think there's a real connection between structural reparations and the agenda of transformative justice. And here I'm referring particularly to the work of, of Paul Grady, Simon Robbins, and uh, um, uh, Sabine uh, Michalowski, uh, Clara Sandoval at Essex, and, and others who've been doing a lot of work in, in this domain. The thrust of transformative justice and why I think it's relevant for our discussions today is that it says that there is a real need to go beyond just an individual reckoning for past human rights violations. And there needs instead to be a focus on what is required to fundamentally alter the societal structures that produced and compounded uh, these violations. And in particular, what the transformative justice agenda has brought to transitional justice debates is a much stronger socioeconomic focus, 
where previously a lot of the emphasis had been on individual criminal accountability and, and truth telling. What we see in the debates about reparations uh, currently uh, across the world are these persistent tensions uh, around will reparations be delivered individually or collectively, uh, persistent questions about whether reparations should take a material uh, or a symbolic form. And a lot of these debates center on who should deliver reparations, who pays, basically. But I think what we need in debates about reparations, building on Coates's work in the US, building on the transformative justice agenda, is a much deeper grappling with what structural reparations would actually require in different contexts. And I think this includes the Colombian context. Dealing with structural reparations, of course, will inevitably deal with all of these other questions that I've already raised. It will mean dealing with some combination of individual and collective reparations. Rather than a binary, it's undoubtedly going to be some combination of that. This is probably going to require delivering material and symbolic reparations. And to a certain extent, that's a false binary anyway, because the material always carries a deep symbolic value. There is a, a deep symbolic importance to large reparations payments, um, for example. But I think what we need if we're going to think about structural reparations is a much clearer sense of what the ultimate goal of reparations must be. And I think a, a structural emphasis reframes the overall aim as being for reparations to deliver comprehensive remedies that redress historical harm, that restore victims' dignity, but in a way that fundamentally alters the societal structures and mechanisms that enable those violations in the first place. So I think that the crux here is that structural reparations asks us to be comprehensive, multi-leveled, to deal with the harm that has been committed, but at a society-wide uh, framework, rather than only seeing this as narrowed down to the discrete individuals or collectives who may have been very directly harmed by, by past violations. I think structural reparations pushes us towards something that is much deeper and much more society-wide in that sense. And I wanna finish, I guess, by just highlighting some of the places around the world where I think this kind of grappling around structural reparations uh, is actually taking place at the moment. And maybe the easiest way to kind of sketch this enormous international uh, terrain, and, and, I, and I think Luke and others who, who are doing this much more systematically than I am will probably be scandalized by, by the way that I'm gonna to try to, to do this in just a matter of minutes, but, but let me attempt it nevertheless. I, I, I see really kind of three big trends in reparation schemes around the world at the moment. And I think this uh, grappling with, with structural reparations is taking place in each of these three realms. I think one key trend internationally at, at the moment um, is towards colonial reparations. Huge debates taking place um, on almost all continents around what is owed uh, by former colonial masters to their uh, former colonies because of the lasting legacies, the lasting structural legacies of colonialism. We can see this, for example, in current debates about what Germany owes the Herero people uh, and the Nama people um, of Namibia. Big debates there about whether Germany's dedication to simply delivering um, a very broad-based development package is enough in reparations terms. Isn't this in many ways just the form of development that Germany probably would have delivered to Namibia anyway, even if there wasn't this backdrop of, of massive violence and massive harm committed during the, the period of, of German colonization? There are also similar debates going on in relation to various Caribbean islands um, claiming reparations from the British government. Um, Britain is in the firing line for, for numerous colonial reparations cases and claims at the moment. If you look at the case of Jamaica, one of the big debates are taking place in that context at the moment is precisely what form of reparations would be demanded of the British government. Um, and again, is it going to simply pick off particular individuals or particular groups who are seen as most acutely harmed by colonialism, or is it going to do something to fundamentally alter the socioeconomic conditions of the entire country? So this entire domain of 
colonial reparations is is one of the, the the terrains upon which structural reparations are currently being debated. A second key trend uh, internationally is to, to hear invocations of reparations in relation to corporate actors and, 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 and raising the issue of corporate complicity in mass atrocities. In this particular category, we see reparations being demanded of the often faceless actors who enable uh, massive human rights violations, those who aid and abet atrocities. Uh, and again, we see some very important structural reparations tensions in, in this category. A crucial recent example would be uh, the involvement of the Kulamani uh, Victims Group in South Africa, which uh, took a very uh, well-publicized legal case to the US um, under the Alien Torts Claim Act, seeking reparations for crimes committed in the apartheid period from major international corporate actors like Daimler, Chrysler, IBM, uh, Barclays Bank, and others. The argument that Kulamani was bringing was that um, even though it wasn't always visible, these multinational organizations were absolutely central to the way that the apartheid state uh, carried out its structural violence uh, against black South Africans. And, and this um, was a feature of apartheid that, that often was invisible even to many South Africans themselves, let alone internationally. Um, that case, unfortunately, fell apart for legal technicalities in the way that that particular act changed in, in the US, but it raised, I think, this important issue of the reparations that are owed uh, by corporate actors in, in the way that violations are carried out. We also see similar questions at the moment, uh, even in the last week or two, uh, in relation to the Rwandan genocide suspect, uh, Felicien Kabuga, uh, who was arrested in Paris about two weeks ago. Kabuga is charged, in essence, with uh, providing the finance for the genocide against the Tutsi uh, in 1994. And in the last week, we have seen calls by Ibuka, which is the um, Rwandan umbrella survivors organization, for reparations to be paid by Kabuga if he is found guilty of, of aiding and abetting the Rwandan genocide. Kabuga, of course, was one of Rwanda's wealthiest business people in the 1990s. Uh, he's charged with financing the hate radio station, of uh, financing the Interahamwe, the, um, the Hutu militias that carried out many of the major massacres in the genocide. And this comes uh, against a backdrop in the Rwandan context of real frustration amongst many genocide survivors um, that reparations, including financial compensation, has been promised by the Rwandan government, but um, in most cases has not been delivered. Um, and my colleague uh, Felix Indahinda, I think, has written some of the best uh, work on analyzing Rwandan frustrations over failures to deliver reparations, including reparations from these faceless corporate actors that enabled the genocide in, in 1994. Part of this debate in Rwanda also has a structural dimension. Again, if we look at the statement by Ibuka in relation to the Kabuga case, Ibuka is also making the point that they are not only demanding reparations for individual genocide survivors, but this would have to involve uh, large scale socioeconomic development in survivor communities and the wider society uh, to reflect the, the deep societal damage that the genocide did um, in the years after 1994. So in the Kulamani case and in the Kabuga case, we see reparations of a structural nature being attached to these questions of corporate complicity. Finally, I think the third major terrain internationally um, today where we see these issues of structural reparations being uh, debated and, 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 and playing out is in relation to the, uh, the ICC's Victim Trust Fund. And it's, it's within the International Criminal Court that I think we are seeing some of the big tensions around reparations currently paying out. Um, playing out, I should say. Paying out is probably a slip of the tongue. But, uh, um, one immediate point to make about the ICC, and, and, and in many ways, I think this is a, a scandalous point, is that the court to date has paid out more compensation to its own staff members for violations of their employment rights um, than uh, the court has paid out to victims of atrocities in, in any of the situation countries where it's investigated crime. So there, there is a real frustration, especially in 
many of the African situation countries where the ICC is operating, that the ICC's reparations momentum has tended to be inward looking rather than, than outward looking. But we have seen the ICC through the registry and through the Victims Trust Fund already begin to deliver some reparations following the convictions, especially of a series of, of uh, Congolese rebel leaders. Um, we have already seen reparations paid out uh, in the Lubanga case. Um, there are current debates going on about what will happen in the Katanga case, um, and most recently in the, the case of Bosco Ntanganda. One of the tensions in the way that the ICC has gone about dealing with the question of reparations, and I think this is not just relegated to the ICC, it's an issue for reparations debates much, much more broadly, is that of course victims of crimes are only eligible to receive ICC reparations if they can be defined as the direct victims of the very specific crimes um, that have been prosecuted successfully by, by the ICC's Office of the Prosecutor. So if you may be a victim of Thomas Lubunga's crimes, but you are not eligible for reparations unless you can show that you were directly connected to the crimes that were dealt with in, in the courtroom. And of course, that is leading to, to real disenchantment amongst many victims of atrocities, especially in the Aturi region of, of, of northeastern Congo. There is also a big debate going on in the context of the Katanga case about the cultural specificity of reparations in a country like Congo. What, what do meaningful reparations in fact look like um, in relation to the, the very specific affected communities? And I think what this debate gets at is that you can have a very distant international court that has a particular conception of what reparations might look like, often with a highly material uh, feature, but that may not necessarily resonate with the specific expectations of individual and collective victims on the ground in, in a place like Ituri. So the, the ICC's grappling with reparations at the moment is throwing up some very important questions about cross-cultural um, tensions. And again, within all of this, in the Congo context, there is a real sense, and I've seen this in meetings that I've attended um, amongst Congolese civil society in, in Bunya and other parts of Ituri, a real sense of will any of these reparations change the fundamental conditions that people live with today? Will it in fact alter the socioeconomic, the cultural, the political structures that have contributed to, to so much of their um, experience of violations in the last 20 or 30 years. Um, so I think in the ICC context, we also see some very important debates currently going on about um, what form reparations should take and can it get at this, this structural element that, that Coates talks about. So to wrap things up, this is really the kind of backdrop that I would like to paint um, for our uh, in-depth discussion of, of the Colombian case. Undoubtedly, the Colombian case also throws up these elements of colonialism and the corporate abetting of atrocities. So we see these dimensions internationally, but they clearly play an important role in the Colombian case. And Colombia may yet enter that terrain of the ICC. We know that the ICC has preliminary investigations underway in Colombia. It's uh, yet to be seen whether the ICC becomes more fully fledged in the Colombian case, but the ICC may also become an important player uh, in the Colombian context. And then we're likely to see many of the same tensions that the ICC has faced around reparations in, in different African states as well. The key, I think, in all of this, um, and, and this is the, the big point, I guess, I would like to inject into today's discussion, is can we start to get at this issue of, of structural reparations? Um, how do we put more of a focus on that? How do we think about what that means in particular places? And I think what it, it, it really requires of us is a, a much more comprehensive understanding of, of what reparations uh, is likely to require in societies grappling with the, the legacies of, of, of mass atrocities. Thank you. Amazing, Phil. Amazing. Thank you so much for that comprehensive approach. It's really, really thought provoking and I think it really lays the ground for now the presentation of uh, Clara Sandoval, who is professor of the School of Law at the University of Essex. And I guess, Clara, I, Phil was very good towards the end in particular to start, you know, framing the, the issues that he has uh, put forward uh, in regards to the Colombian case. So why don't you help us to get a sense of uh, what has happened in Colombia in terms of reparations over the last um, of the of, over the last uh, years and uh, and what are the huge challenges that we are uh, seeing in Colombia now in particular with these very 
a sort of ambitious approach that has been made even bigger by a Colombian by a peace agreement in 2016 that created new mechanisms for reparations to the victims. So over to you, Clara. So good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you so much, Andre, and to everyone involved in the organization of this event, Jovet, uh, Herman, to my other partners in crime today, Phil, Luis Carlos. Uh, it's really a pleasure to, to have the opportunity to dialogue with you about reparations. I just uh, should, should disclaim that I am one part of Luke Moffett's project uh, working on reparations. Uh, so I have to disclose that because that also brings some bias, some information, but also some bias. And I also work at the moment on an HRC grant with my colleague Sabine Mikalowski, uh, supporting the work of the Special Jurisdiction for Peace, where we are looking at issues that connect reparation with, for example, issues like alternative sanctions, sanciones propias, just to, uh, to name it in Spanish, or issues related, very important to reparations like victims' participation. Uh, so saying that, I, I would like to say the following, uh, just to contextualize conversations about Colombia. Why do we say that Colombia is an ambitious program uh, or why is the bet in Colombia so ambitious? People say or name three, three things. The first one is that in Colombia in the year 2011, we got a law 1448, which is the Victims and Land Restitution Law which just by reading it in theory is a magnificent piece of law. It's super comprehensive. It really stands to the test of international standards on reparation, but it also captures very nicely in various articles uh, the idea that reparation should be transformative. And it uh, engages with this idea in various dimensions, for example, through uh, including a very powerful gender dimension, just, just to briefly just put that on the table. The other reason why it is very ambitious is because it tries to bring together not only reparation, but also issues of assistance. And reparation is not limited to compensation, satisfaction, rehabilitation. Uh, I leave the issue about guarantees of non-repetition to the side for a moment till to deal with this structural issue, but also brings together issues related to land restitution. And as you can imagine, in a highly unequal country like East Colombia, also in terms of land distribution and where land has really fueled conflict, this issue becomes absolutely central. So a massive bet about trying to capture magically somehow all forms of reparation. Uh, but besides the law, we have a massive issue in the country. And is that in Colombia, more than 15% of the population are victims. So we have right now 8.900 million victims registered approximately in the country. And this is massive if you bear in mind that in most other conflict situations where they have set up a domestic reparation program, the number has been about 5% of the population. So this immediately puts Colombia off the charts and also highlights how difficult it would be for a country like Colombia, even being an economy that is, you know, a middle income economy, et cetera, to respond to that massive challenge of bringing or providing reparation in the terms of this very, very ambitious law. So I think these are the reasons one could get into other reasons, but I would say those are the reasons why we present this as an ambitious reparation program. Now, what about the practice? And I think we need to care about it. Uh, the theory is beautiful in Colombia. We have been fantastic at enacting amazing laws, starting with the 1991 constitution and before. But the key challenge, and this is a key issue worldwide, challenging reparations and not only reparation programs, is lack of implementation and the many difficulties that hamper the process of reparation. And I want to know this. Reparation is not only about giving compensation, providing restitution, it's also about the process. And I think this idea of the process also captures elements of the structural change that is needed. And we link very nicely, I think, with ideas that Luis Carlos, I think, can put on the table about the arts and the way victims experience these dignifying moments of you know, fulfilling the right to reparation. But I want to, to get a bit into the achievements. I want to start with the positives about Colombia. 
uh, to then really dig into the negatives, which I think are more. I, I don't want to be pessimistic about Colombia, but I really want to, to put the issues on the table. I think it's my obligation. So achievements. I think uh, there is a massive network of civil society uh, members, victims, massive, strong communities of victims in the country that have been able to create a political terrain for a struggle. Uh, and that terrain was the one that made possible the Victims and Land Restitution Law, that is making possible the permanent pressure on a daily basis to try and achieve reparation. And this linked with the presence of this very network that made it possible also within state institutions. So I think I find it very difficult to say we have now, because we have President Duque in power, we have a state that is completely against reparation. I think that that would be a very simplistic picture of what reparations are about or how we go about achieving them. There are people, I know people working at the Victims Unit in Colombia that work incredibly hard on a daily basis to try to materialize reparation. And some of these persons have occupied different places uh, in civil society organizations and so on. So these uh, structural changes among who are the people that make reparation possible definitely have an impact on achieving reparation. And we see that, for example, and this is just like a, a little question mark, um, a, a little parenthesis, but in Colombia, with the special jurisdiction for peace, I think one of the beauties of the special jurisdiction for peace is that it managed to alter somehow the structures of distribution of people uh, within civil society, within the state, within the military, etc. And we got a highly experimental somehow uh, a special jurisdiction for peace that mixes uh, different uh, members of society. And I think this is crucial to, to push forward and get consensus, although it's difficult, uh, for reparation. But I think that broad social consensus and that broad social network about reparation in the country is one of the key achievements and in my view is part of the hope uh, to continue making reparations possible. This does not exist in other countries. Yes, uh, and we've seen it, for example, with Luke in the countries we've done work uh, to compare the strength of civil society organizations and victims groups and communities in Colombia with those, for example, just not, I don't need to go that far. Think about Guatemala, which has a great anti-impunity movement but I don't think that anti-impunity movement has been able to bridge to the reparations dimension. Yes, so just to give that example, or just to go to the Central African Republic, or just go to Uganda, or just go to the cent uh, to, to DRC. Uh, you know, I, I I wouldn't compare, and I know I, I have I have said this to Phil in the past, uh, and he can reply to this saying they are very strong. Yes, but I I believe that Colombia. Uh, has a very, very strong network, uh, and that's an opportunity. Uh, the other important thing, in my view, is that in the country, we have institutions working in comparison to other uh, post-conflict situations where institutions cannot work because they simply don't exist. In Colombia, we have some institutionality and some strong institutions. Most of them tend to be in the big cities, but I think that one of the achievements of these years of implementation of the Victims and Land Restitution Law is that they have also been able to strengthen some of the local dimensions of uh, trying to provide reparations to victims. And so if you have a network of people that are really pushing for reparation and you have the institutional network within the state capable to deliver it, I think that maximizes the probability that reparation can be possible. So, and, and I cannot accentuate this much more, you know, implementation doesn't happen if you don't have people and institutions and a commitment. Uh, uh, so that's why uh, I wanted to mention that one. And the final achievement is that, uh, in, and if you compare this with other places in the world, is that in Colombia, we are still facing a great momentum for reparations, even despite COVID-19. And I want to note that. Because in Colombia, somehow, the whole reparations debate began very strongly since the victims and land, uh, since the justice and peace law. So I'm talking about the year 2005 when these first questions were addressed uh, badly 
or rightly, but they began to be addressed since then. And I think momentum has been going up instead of going down. There have been moments when there have been fluctuations, but broadly speaking, I see a tendency to have some kind of momentum going on, explained by different reasons, social mobilization, the strong legal culture we have in the country, but particularly the peace agreement and the fact that we have different factions with whom we need to negotiate. So the peace agreement with the FARC brings again issues about reparations to the table. Now the ELN again, you know, so I think this is very important because at the end of the day, even if this is very much also a matter of a legal discussion, this is also a political discussion. And we will need key allies to make it happen, to get the support of uh, strong actors in society uh, to make it possible. So for me, those are those are the achievements. And one last one that I that I want to mention and, and is unnoticed, and I've mentioned it before, some of you have heard me talking about it, and is this special form of rehabilitation collective preparation um, experience called Entrelazando, Interbowen which is a process established by the victims unit uh, some years back uh, to precisely try to fill the gap that the health system was unable to fill to provide rehabilitation to victims but doing it using the communities uh, as the key center of how can we deal with this terrible harm and uh, i don't have time to get into that but i think that the Victims Unit has accumulated very relevant experience that cannot be discarded uh, and that needs to be, you know, really looked into in order to understand what made it positive, what were, and I think one of the key issues in this case was precisely that they, it empowered the community to help with this healing process. Yes, it was not only about the Victims Unit arriving and telling them this is done this way, no, it was about letting them have their own experiences of healing, of mourning, of renaming places so that they were not anymore the place of a massacre, but now they are the place where their children can play and dream a future. So I think, and these are also not very expensive experiences in terms of costs, but that can really have a meaningful transformative dimension for victims. So I think we need to rescue these types of experiences. There are parentheses, in Colombia, for example, before the Victims Unit and, and the Victims and Land Restitution Law, we also had the Comisión Nacional de Reparación y Reconciliación, the CNRR. And that uh, commission was also involved in some very interesting uh, experiences related to collective reparation. We've done very little to try and reflect on that experience, what that achieved, and what foundations it created for the Victims Unit. And here I want to say also reparations, that idea of a process that I was bringing in before, is something we need to do a step by step. It's building blocks, connecting blocks, not, you know, this was that experience, we close the door, and then we move to, to the next issue. Uh, but then challenges. Uh, first of all, and you said it very well, Andre, the conflict in Colombia continues. How can we talk about a successful reparation program when uh, human rights defenders are being killed the way they are being killed in the country, when right now, as a result of COVID, those illegal actors in various parts of the country are threatening victims, not allowing them to claim their rights, are taking over land, et cetera. And that's just to, to talk about what is going on now with COVID, but we know that drug trafficking continues to happen. We know that not all the FARC members demobilize. We know that various paramilitary groups have gone back uh, to, to taking up the arms, uh, et cetera. Uh, so in this context, making reparation, that transformative reparation the law talks about, I think is pretty, pretty difficult, if not simply impossible. And that's because the structural issues have not been fully addressed. And maybe here I just should say this before I forget, because I think it's very important. The Victims and Land Restitution Law creates a domestic reparation program, and domestic reparation programs are not primarily about a structural change, even if through them you can achieve some structural change. Yes, they are part of what you need to bring about a structural change, but they by themselves cannot exhaust uh, guarantees of non-repetition. 
they can empower victims. And by empowering victims, you are contributing to transformation, right? But domestic reparation programs are not the ones that need to take or bring into account corporate actors, for example, or that are going to deal with uh, um, illicit uh, drug trafficking, etc. Yes, so there is a dimension they can deal with, but not all the issues or root causes of conflict and violations. I, I think that's important because we don't need, we cannot overestimate what these domestic reparations can do, they are incredibly fragile. The second issue that I think uh, is crucial challenge is to ensure that victims secure reparation in this terrible context. But uh, what is the point of this very ambitious law if almost 10 years down the line, we have about 10% of implementation in terms, and by this I mean about 10% of the victims of the 8,800,000 victims have secured some form of reparation. 10%. And this is uh, a, a, a very, you know, I'm not saying that it's, it's bad. If I compare this with Guatemala, where about 32,000 of the more than 200,000 victims have received any form of reparation, well, to say that 800,000 in Colombia have received reparation in this brief period of time is a lot. But it's not when you know that we are talking about 8 million victims in the country. Uh, so I think the challenge, the challenge we have is massive. According to, um, uh, the, 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 according to those that are trying to see how long it will take us to implement the law, uh, there are calculus that indicate that it will take between 57 years to 70 years to fully implement the law in the terms it contains, to provide compensation to victims. Just to provide compensation to victims uh, between uh, 2019 and 2021 requires about 60 billion Colombian pesos, 60 billion Colombian pesos. So we are talking about a massive amount of money that the country doesn't have. So this takes me to a key problem, challenge, and is lack of financial resources. And if we look at Duque's presidential period, indeed, there is a correlation between the reduction of funds for the domestic reparation, for the fund uh, to, to provide reparations and, and, and lack of financial resources. It's, there you can see it. Indeed, I was shocked to see this, that the victims unit had last year, 2019, about 30% of the budget that is given to the National Institute for the Welfare of the Family, Instituto Colombiano de Bienestar Familiar. When the, the massive, a mandate that this unit has uh, is 8 million victims to which it has to provide not only compensation but also other forms uh, of reparation. Another key challenge that we have is the issue about recognition of responsibility by the state and other actors and this is no minor issue. Many victims uh, I have had the opportunity to speak to as a lawyer or doing my, my field work as an academic have always told me once and again that for them, reparation, meaning compensation or access to rehabilitation, et cetera, means nothing if there is no recognition of responsibility. They want, they want those that committed the crime to be able to say, yes, we did it. And, and hopefully we are sorry about that. And if you look at the victims uh, and land restitution law, there is an article there where the Colombian government uh, decides, or the Colombian state decides to provide reparations somehow in solidarity and in good faith, but not as a recognition of responsibility. And this issue can be contested, uh, I believe. So I believe that uh, one key contribution and one that is not expensive, one that doesn't cost any money, but yes, morally and you know, emotionally might be uh, strongly contested is to say, yes, I'm sorry, I did it. Uh, and I think reconciliation starts uh, there. The other key problem for me is the compartmentalization and fracture of transitional justice mechanisms and other systems in the country. So I said one strength is that we have these institutions, but the problem is that we have not been able to properly coordinate the work of all of these institutions. So just to give you an example, the system uh, for the attention of victims has more than 50 institutions across the state dealing with it, which is potentially a strength, but if there is no coordination, it becomes a massive problem because it will only delay access to reparation for victims. 
So we need to think about how we can streamline uh, these mechanisms. And here, uh, others than lawyers need to help in that process. Uh, but having said that, there is also an issue here uh, that I've seen, and is the way we have bureaucratized uh, the whole institutionality of a state that provides reparation. Uh, you know, not only good people want to work on reparation, also bureaucrats, and they and that's that's their safety net, and and they don't care, they don't know, uh, and then we maintain a bureaucracy. Uh, so. How do we deal with issues like this and what role victims play also in that bureaucratization process are key questions for me. Another key challenge, and I'm sorry to have so many, uh, Andre, but is the coexistence of reparation mechanisms. I cannot think of a country where there are more reparation mechanisms than Colombia. If you know of one, please let me know because I will go and study the one. Uh, Colombia has not only domestic reparations via this law that I've been mentioning, but for example, under the Justice and Peace Law, it had also been dealing with reparations, although there were changes precisely because under that law, it was proven that providing reparations to victims via courts in the quantity of the Colombian case uh, was simply unmanageable. It was not going to happen. And it was simply impossible also because you couldn't start giving one victim X and another victim Y and another victim T. But we also have the Council of a State that uh, orders reparations against the state for, for human rights violations, etc. cetera. Uh, and, and we have also the Inter-American Court and potentially we could have the International Criminal Court and all of these layers, and here I'm just simplifying uh, for, because of time, but all of these layers of reparation create massive challenges for victims in terms of where do I go? How can I access reparation? Uh, I am a class A or a class B victim who has priority for one of these mechanisms, uh, et cetera. And this can do more harm than good, particularly in societies that have not enough resources to provide reparation. Uh, and the other key a point that I, maybe I should have linked to the point when I talk about responsibility is that in Colombia, in a country where we have 8 million victims, but this is applicable to any other one, uh, responsibility cannot only be about state institutions and agents recognizing responsibility, but we need all those others that uh, Phil was referring to to, to accept responsibility. And that might also start with us as individual people. I remember talking with uh, Luis Jorge Garay, a great economist in Colombia, who was saying, you know, if we really want to fill that deficit gap, we have to pay for reparations. We need to increase taxes, probably six points to what we have now. And that's like, wow, that's massive, right? Uh, but I think it starts with us as well. So there is an issue about that solidarity, how ready am I to contribute to reparations as a person in Colombia that by action or omission has also allowed this to happen, right? It's the same country, the same victims, even if they have always been invisible for many, but we can contribute to it. How do we, for example, take over the assets, uh, and this is a massive challenge of, of corporations and other actors that have contributed uh, to, to, to these crimes? How do we deal with the military? Uh, and so on and so forth. And, and here, uh, then I go back to a point I wanted to make uh, because it links there to the issue about a better articulation of the victims unit and all the system for the attention of victims with the system established by the peace agreement in relation to truth, justice, reparation and guarantees of non-recurrence. I think one of the beauties of the Colombian peace agreement is that it creates a system. And for the first time, we have all transitional justice pillars at work, yes? Uh, but if it is a system, it is not meant to have compartmentalized parts, but one part will be able to work because you have another part allowing it to work, right? So we need to think a systems theory approach to this uh, experience in Colombia. And there, just to bring the special jurisdiction for peace to the table, uh, a massive opportunity we have is that if well the peace agreement maintains uh, the, the victims unit and reparations through the victims and land restitution law, uh, the, the peace agreement also 
tries to bring in some other reparatory dimensions of further mechanisms. And that happens, for example, with the special jurisdiction for peace. So the special jurisdiction for peace is not about providing reparations. It is not a mechanism that will provide reparations. But it, of course, justice itself is a form of reparation, point one. And that we, we, we cannot forget. So the, the symbolic dimension of what the special jurisdiction for peace is doing is a form of reparation. And that's why it's so important that it does it well in that symbolic dimension. Uh, but the second element that I think uh, would be very important here is the issue about, for example, sanciones propias. Sanciones propias are meant to apply to the most responsible, those found to be most responsible that have uh, confessed and, and said all the truth, uh, etc. For example, FARC members for the commission of kidnapping or members of the military for the false positives uh, killings, extrajudicial killings that have taken place. Uh, that sanction propia, which is an alternative sanction, somehow I don't like the translation, but uh, it's a way to put it, it's an alternative sanction that restricts freedom, but does not deprive the person from freedom. Uh, that particular one must have a reparatory dimension. So we need to think, for example, and I think this is a beautiful opportunity that the jurisdiction has to think how we are going to punish these most responsible, because it's punishment but with a reparatory dimension. So what can the FARC do in cases like the kidnapping cases for the victims? What would be meaningful for them? And here, many questions come up. Do we, do we allow participation of victims in this process? What kind of participation? How do we get their views? Yes, what about the views of the perpetrators? Remember, for example, that the FARC are also meant, uh, well, are a political party, and are meant to exercise their political rights. How do we, for example, reconciliate that possibility of being political actors with the possibility of at the same time uh, punishing them with these sanciones propias and at the same time trying to have some reparatory dimension? Beautiful opportunities, but this is just an example for you to think about reparation. How? These sanciones propias hopefully will benefit uh, the victims that need it the most, yes? In particular areas in Colombia, the, the peace agreement has selected about 170 municipalities of the country that are the most affected, where it has created this idea of a PEDED, which is a special development uh, program with a territorial approach to precisely try to respond to those structural problems, Phil. So there is an opportunity with these PEDEDs, uh, I call all of you to try and look how do we deal with this? Because uh, I think not many are looking at the pedets and we need to look at what pedets are doing today, whether they are being implemented, what role communities are playing in them, but also at collective reparations, because many of the collective reparations, at least half of them are happening in pedets municipalities. So you have reparations by the victims unit happening in places where that idea of bringing to some equality conditions victims is central, yes? And we need to provide sanciones propias in those contexts too. So is there a way that we can create or streamline a system that will enhance rather than undermine uh, the potential of all of these mechanisms working together in order to achieve some transformation? Uh, and I think this is a unique, unique opportunity. And for those of you doing research on this, I draw your attention to that because we need really a data about how this is happening, what the problems are. We need to show the way uh, with this interrelation because it has not really happened uh, elsewhere. And finally, and I know I am I, I, just two minutes, Andre, that's always my problem, I apologize, but I get very passionate about this, uh, is this. Uh, transparency and access to information. Uh, some information is available, but not all. And the way information is portrayed is sometimes misleading. And the information should be not only about numbers, but also about the quality of the experience. I think that with victims, more than turning a victim into number one that received compensation, I really would like to know, I, I would really like to have quality indicators that show me how the victim has experienced that and how the victim has been empowered through that process. And I think that there we have a massive 
a massive problem as well as uh, providing broad access to information. And we see it, for example, with, with land restitution. Uh, some information is available. The, uh, the unit for land restitution provides some information, but there are some gaps in the data. And I think for us to be able to enforce and to try to push forward the right to reparation, we need better data. Uh, although Colombia has to say, in contrast to other countries, and again, I go back to Guatemala, because for me, Guatemala was, was a scandal. Uh, well, of course, we do quite well in Colombia. We have a registry, we have data, we have reports, we have accountability mechanisms overlooking the victim's unit and the like. Uh, but it still, it's not enough. And I think we need more on that regard. Uh, finally, I just conclude uh, with this. Uh, I think that there is a clear field for political struggle in Colombia. There was a unique momentum now in the last three, four months because the, the victims and land restitution law, the first 10 years are coming to an end. The Colombian Constitutional Court came up with a great decision in December saying that if the government basically didn't act on it, to extend the life of the victim's law, it was basically extended for 10 more years. So basically the Colombian Constitutional Court took ownership of that, which I think is fantastic. But now there are various discussions in Congress as to whether and how the law must be um, reformed. And if so, how? And this is dangerous, dangerous, but important. Uh, while we had that momentum, now COVID hits in. And COVID somehow changes the way we relate to each other, changes the opportunities for participation of victims. Although I said victims are very strong in Colombia, in Colombia, the access to ICTs remains very low for victims. So Colombia is one of the countries in the region with high, well, you know, going quite high in terms of access to ICTs, but that's part of the population, not the victim's population. So, how do we ensure that victims remain able to put pressure on the key uh, state institutions, people, etc., so that the right to reparation is not damaged is a question mark. I, I don't think that it's impossible, but we need to uh, strengthen that ability. And that might be by giving them access to, to ICTs, by training them on how best to use these mechanisms, uh, etc. I think that's uh, absolutely crucial. And I think that we need to put pressure also on the budget. Uh, if Colombia doesn't increase uh, the amount of money that goes into reparation, this is going to take forever and yet will be another opportunity missed. And, and with that, I finish saying the Colombian peace agreement creates various opportunities for a structural change that if linked properly and adequately with the content of the victims and land restitution law and the work of the other systems of the TJ uh, uh, bet within the agreement, I think we can maximize transformation, but I don't believe that reparations, and, and, and I know I've said before the opposite, but I have reviewed my views. <laughs> I, I don't believe that reparation can be fully transformative on their own. It can contribute, it has something very important to contribute, but it needs of other state interventions uh, and other state transitional justice mechanisms. Thank you. Thank you, Clara. That's, um, you know, a very, very comprehensive picture of what's happening in Colombia, such a complex system. But I think we now need to go over to, um, to Luis uh, Carlos Sotelo Castro, who is in Canada. And I think his, his presentation will be very important because you know, in, in at least since 2014 in transitional justice, uh, we have been discussing more and more the role of art in transitional justice. And, you know, the, there are huge new research being done on the role of art and reparations. And Luis Carlos precisely works uh, on the University of Concordia in the theater department, and he's been working on the role of listening and voices. And so over to you, Luis, to try to, to, to help us understand how art can help in terms of reparations. Well, thank you very much, Andre, and uh, hello, everyone, and thank you for the invitation. I, I want to start by asking you to make sure you place yourself and your body uh, comfortable, make any change you need to do after one hour or so of talking, so please 
stretch or whatever, get ready for what I want to share with you. So I will share my screen. Okay, so I do think that the arts have a role to play in the context of Colombia's transitional justice uh, process. And I want to suggest that we need to look at a new form of art that I call re reparative performance, right? I start with this picture here because, well, it was created for one of the projects that I'm working uh, on. Uh, it was created by um, member, by Colombian refugees who are here in Quebec. And as you can see, is the, is, is basically the image of a home, a home that is uh, at peace where you can have the time to take care of every detail, put the table on, make it beautiful. And I started with this image because um, oh, wait a minute, Let me check. Because the question is, where do we start to think about reparation and, uh, and the question of repairing what? So for instance, uh, there is this case, it, was, it is famous in Colombia, uh, an ex-soldier uh, was kidnapped by guerrilla group FARC and was taken hostage really for 13 years in total, well, nearly 13 years. Uh, it became a very famous case because his father, uh, well, the soldier is called Pablo Emilio Moncayo, and his father, Gustavo Moncayo, became very famous because he performed a very long walk from southern Colombia to Bogota, and uh, it took them, it took him more than 40 days under very difficult conditions, he chained his hands using the same type of chains that the guerrilla uses to, uh, you know, uh, secure their, their hostages. So he was, he left on Father's Day um, just to symbolize as well that a father cannot stay at home when his uh, son is being held hostage somewhere else. Right. So one of the things that Gustavo Moncayo said in a book where he reflects about his action was violence knocked on our house or on, on, our, on our door. So basically, he always thought violence is something that happens outside home and suddenly home destroyed the peace that there was at home. So one of the questions is, how do you go about restoring home, restoring this harmonious um, family and peace that there is at home. And in particular, when you spent 13 years waiting and uh, then all the things that happened happens in between, not only with the acts by the guerrilla, but then also even the acts by the military who didn't uh, support the families at all, uh, not even, I mean, three years into the kidnapping, they had not even received uh, psychological support or anything like that. Uh, and so there are a number of harms that were caused to the entire family, not just, not just to the person who was kidnapped, not just to the father who actively was uh, looking for him, but for the sisters, for the grandkids of the, of the father and the mother later. And then, there is another complexity to this, and that is that because they became so visible um, and because basically what the father was claiming was that the government had to negotiate with the guerrilla for humanitarian reasons and uh, negotiate the release of the, of, the, of the hostages. There were more than 500 people held hostage, right? And the government didn't want the policy implemented by uh, the government of Alvaro Uribe uh, was basically 
we will not negotiate with terrorists because he used the term that the Bush administration in the US started to use after 9-11. So uh, the claims of this and the campaigning on this fa of this family uh, turned them into a target for ex extreme right-wing uh, uh, movements. And once the, the, the sun was released, they continue to be threatened now by right-wing people. And uh, to the point that really they had to go into exile and they are now in Canada uh, where they are trying to repair, if you want, their life. So one of the things that I have been doing is to really have dialogues with this family here in Montreal and uh, with, uh, with other victims and really facilitate dialogues on what does it take from their perspective? How do they, and, and, and believe me, it is incredibly difficult because one of the uh, things that really happens, I will, I will jump here to, to go to one uh, big point that I want to make uh, here is that, let me see, it. I want to make here the point that the big tension that there is the fundamental drama, if you want, in all this problem um, is that in a post-conflict context, there is a big tension between forces that are silencing others and forces that are really struggling to be listened to and to be heard. I would say this is a dramatic uh, tension, which is basically the the material of all drama, of all theater, of all performance, uh, but not only of artistic performances, also of um, social drama. So um, uh, I want to, uh, I, I really want to focus on this question of this fundamental tension because I think where arts have something to do is in this point of facilitating listening, facilitating uh, processes and spaces where people can break the silence, which is obviously very difficult. So I want to ba basically say that I want to acknowledge that uh, the arts practice in Colombia is thriving. There are a huge number of people just doing uh, experiments and um, and not only artists, but also anthropologists, filmmakers, uh, activists, victims, a number of people. But one of the problems that, uh, that we have, I would say, similar to what Clarita describes in terms of the many measures that are happening simultaneously, is that there are not many spaces where artists come together and discuss their practices, right? So basically, we, um, one of the things what, that we need to do is to uh, stop for a moment and reflect on what's happening, how are we doing it, and how the art practice is connecting or in dialogue with um, more institutional reparation measures, which is uh, really a very fruitful uh, enterprise, I would say. So uh, my presentation is not an overview of what many artists are doing. I will very selfishly focus on the work that I am doing. It's a research creation process. When I say research creation, I mean that we do artistic practice and we investigate it, right? And we have created in Concordia something that uh, I called the Acts of Listening Lab, which is a performance space that creates a safe environment where small groups of people, say between uh, 10 and 25 people can come together and uh, we can build trust. Because be believe me, one of the first points that we need to uh, uh, talk about is how on earth to restore truth, trust. And for, for us to be able to restore trust, trust, we need to also understand how to build safe spaces and how to build intimacy. It's a very difficult thing to do, to create intimacy with strangers and with strangers you don't trust, right? Uh, we have at the lab also, uh, we, I don't see it only as a performance space, but also as what I call a social innovation lab, meaning uh, 
the realization that the problem is a complex problem that cannot be solved by just one discipline. It, bring, it needs to bring together many disciplines uh, and we need to no exchange knowledge. Otherwise, uh, it will not work. So basically what I'm saying is also, we need to redefine art. So art needs to become collaborative participatory practice and we need to acknowledge, and we can talk about that, what that means and later if there are questions, but I also think we need to acknowledge that our practice is a political strategy in this context. And as a political strategy, it comes with risks, it comes with uh, problems both for the artists uh, and for the uh, participants and, and for the communities that uh, are involved. Um, I also want to say that the work that I do is based on oral history, meaning we interview people and it's really acknowledging that it's people's stories and narratives, the, ver the material that we need to work with. And so roughly speaking is really, we're talking about performances of memory. And there are many forms that that can take. It can be audio walks, can be sound installation, um, in general, that's something that I would call applied performance as opposed to non-applied art and performance. And also um, what I will uh, emphasize on today, which is this restorative performance practices. So I want to say that, so in the projects that I'm doing, I, uh, I, I see my work and I think the work of the artist is to um, have alliances. In Montreal, there is a Center for Restorative Justice with whom we are working together to explore the notion of uh, the restorative justice encounters. So one thing that they do is they bring together, for instance, three people who have experienced, uh, say, violent, uh, sexual violence and three offenders who have committed sexual violence. Uh, they are not the victims and the offenders, but they share the same problem, the same experience, and they come together and they have a dialogue that is facilitated by an expert facilitator. Uh, I, will, um, this, I will give you a sense of that project in a minute, but uh, so the project is called Untitled, uh, but the main thing that I really, one of the things that I want to highlight is that um, when we're talking about rest restoration and restorative justice and transformation, we are actually talking about the blending of private and public problems. So it's um, the ability to, um, you know, restore things at the private level of the individual, his or her family, her friends, her communities, but also the question of, if you are doing art and you are presenting it to a public, how does the public take that work? So for instance, when we created a performance to uh, reenact some of the narratives, both of the victim and the offenders who met during the restorative justice uh, project, and we asked, asked the participants, uh, when we asked the audience to give us some feedback. Uh, so one of the feedback that they left on one of the chairs was this one, where it says, if you are an offender, you need to be punished. So it's basically to say, uh, it might be that some of the offenders are ready to uh, ex do these explorations. Some of the victims might be ready, and the, but mm, uh, the public may not be ready. So we need to work at that level too. Uh, I also want to, so before going more into detail about that project on restorative justice, uh, I also want to stress that one of the problems of, of dealing with uh, this big tension uh, between silencing and listening is that obviously um, not everyone wants to uh, be part of restorative processes. So uh, for instance, we had here in 2017, a project where after doing some research, it was the time when the uh, another guerrilla group in Colombia, the ELN, was uh, conducting dialogues with the government of Presidente Santos in Ecuador. And they wanted the community, the uh, in general uh, society to participate in the dialogues. So we 
did some research and we asked ourselves, okay, who is still kidnapped by ELN? So we discovered that there was a politician from a province in Northern Colombia who was still kidnapped. Um, his, uh, uh, his health was not good. So the ELN accepted to release him uh, on exchange for his brother. So his brother accepted to be kidnapped so that his brother could be released. But then the guerrilla threatened them and they said, you don't share in public that your brother remains in uh, under, uh, uh, is held hostage because otherwise we will kill them, we will kill him. So basically we wanted to produce a performance in action us expressing solidarity and hugging the picture of the two brothers uh, and we asked him, can we release this video? Can we um, do this as a means to acknowledge that this is happening to you? Uh, and uh, after, after thinking about it, he said, no, thank you. So basically this is to say, uh, it is very difficult for many people even to go out and say, yes, I need reparation. Um, so, other family, other people, for instance, this is a family who um, left the country in 2004 and uh, whose, uh, uh, the father in the family was killed and uh, the mother was being targeted. Uh, it is, what is interesting and, and, and uh, I want to refer to what Phil was mentioning about structural violence here. What is interesting when you start to listen to the stories is that you realize that the notion of structural uh, violence is very complicated. It doesn't, it's not only related with uh, social injustice and with uh, the legacy of a colonial past, but for instance, when you hear uh, women victims of sexual violence who have been also victims of incest at home and uh, they are not being able to speak about incest uh, you realize that um, the, the, the violence is structural because there are a number of cultural problems uh, that need to be addressed. And they cannot be addressed if we don't talk about them, if we don't listen to them, right? So basically uh, the work of the artist is really to start to develop trust with communities. And that takes a lot of time. So this is an example of workshops that I have been doing at the Colombian consulate with victims. And um, it's, um, it's an, a long process. Also, I want to stress that you need to develop partnerships with, for instance, people like uh, Sherpa. This is an organization that does uh, psychological support to people affected by trauma. So as an artist working with these uh, projects, you cannot work without psychological support. Okay, so I want to basically uh, define uh, this notion of reparation to then uh, uh, go into uh, some claims about what art can do in this context. So I, I agree with this uh, rough definition that reparation are uh, measures uh, provided by a wrongdoing party out of obligation to redress the harm caused to an injured party. Um, but what it's interesting about this is that really for artists to be able to work on reparation, they need to collaborate also with the wrongdoing party. So we, we, we cannot collaborate only with victims. We need to find ways to collaborate with those who have committed the crimes. Uh, and the other, but the other thing, and that's learning also from the practice that we're doing with the Center uh, for Restorative Justice in Montreal. Um, so it's just to say that the range of measures um, can, uh, um, it's, a, it's a big range of, of measures that we can take, right? And, but importantly, it's not only about the substance of the relief, but about the procedure. And, uh, and this is something that I think Clarita already mentioned, but I want to highlight. And that is that artists doing this kind of work really need to think about the process of doing it. 
uh, and and the process can take long. It can take one year, two years, and that is a, a new way of working, right? So I want to give you a couple of examples. Um, Alvaro Restrepo is one of the most uh, uh, important choreographers in Colombia. And in 2011, he did a work called Incilio, Incilio, the Trail of, Tree, uh, of Tears. This is a huge choreography working in collaboration with the Victims Unit and with uh, more than 100 uh, victims of displaced, uh, uh, of forced, of forced displacement. Uh, and one of the interesting things about this project is that he created a circle where uh, victims could be heard. And talking about achievements, one of the achievements of his work in 2013 was that he had the president of Colombia at that time, uh, Juan Manuel Santos, listening, listening to these um, victims presenting themselves. Uh, I want to show you a little bit of the, let me see, of this video, and I will make a comment later. Let's see, hopefully you can see and hear. Rosalba Martínez Vanessa, fui desplazada del atrato medio antioqueño, de una vereda de Vigía del Fuerte. Manejo un grupo cultural de las mujeres afrocolombianas cambirí. Mutró John Jairo Tascó en Beachami, resguardo la María Valparaíso, el suroeste antioqueño. Cultura, Mo. valores, Sane. hogar, Mo de. alegría, Kinajo. futuro, Nubenabaita. memoria, Conicia. riqueza, Nebarakidi. costumbres, de Abatau. origen, Namani. estabilidad. Namadona. So, uh, well, you heard for the first time, actually, perhaps in uh, you know the long history and colonial and post-colonial history of Colombia, there were indigenous voices and indigenous languages heard in the context arena of a public performance uh, with translation. But the president of Colombia was there listening. This is what I would call, and what many people in Colombia say that art can do a kind of symbolic reparation, a dignification of the people who are being hurt. Now, uh, I do have some problems with that, and that's something that I wrote in an article that uh, um, well, was published last year, because my question is, is the president listening or is he performing listening? And by performing listening, you can obviously um, understand at least two things, either pretending that he's listening or performing in the actual sense of really uh, listening carefully what the people are saying. So what I'm saying here is this performance is a choreography. People were not able to speak spontaneously, but it was all pre-recorded. So how, how the performance is done actually in many ways, to me, doesn't help people to say spontaneously what they have to say. Uh, but it is a really important example of the possibilities uh, of, of, of the arts to facilitate dialogues and etc. And here I want to then go more to some of the projects that I am doing to show to you that I think the process needs to be more carefully conducted where listening needs to be studied in small groups, right? So I want to, uh, again, share with you uh, a clip of one of the processes uh, for in the context of the restorative justice uh, event. So here you will hear not a Colombian by, but a Canadian woman from uh, Montreal who was victim of sexual violence. Now, she, we recorded her, her testimony and uh, students, theater students are performing back to her, her testimony. So it, the process of listening involves also the process of enabling the victim who listened back to her own testimony before going public, 
right? So let's see if it works here. I am, I'm touched that people are interested in making things known. And I believe in this project and what you're doing and I think it's wonderful. It was more of a dream that this does exist. And it's nice to know that this does exist, that people do care enough to want to bring something that's real, no matter how much it might hurt, and to bring it to the public. And I want to say thank you very much. My name is Julianne. I'm 55 years old. That's what they say. <laughs> But I'll, I'll be true. I've actually been growing up, so I don't actually know what age I'm at inside right now. But technically, I'm 55 years old. I was sexually abused growing up, and I was witness to violence in the home. I'm going to be celebrating on the 28th of March of this year, five years of escaping domestic violence, which I... So, I mean, it might be a little bit difficult for you to hear, but uh, basically what I'm saying here is um, this process of listening involves technology. It involves recording the conversations, recording the narratives, and then listening back to them again and again. And what I am saying is really, look, the Truth Commission of Colombia, for instance, has recorded so far, I think, some um, at least 800 testimonies. So I collaborate from Montreal also uh, collecting testimonies for the Truth Commission of Colombia. So there are a number of, there is a lot of material already there. And the question is, what's going to happen with that material? Who's going to be, to listen to it? So that's all going to be translated into a report. But how do we engage the audience with all this material uh, that is so powerful? If there is a treasure uh, right now in Colombia is the voices of the people who are being heard and are being shared. Okay, how are we going to be doing that? So basically what I want to say, probably uh, I think I will try to end soon so that we have more of a dialogue. So what um, the, the, the point I want to make is basically that victims have a role to play, a big role to play in all this process of reparation because they are, they, we need to ask them to share with us their testimonies, but then their work doesn't end there. It's only by having conversations about their narratives where the actual work starts. The structural work, uh, the structural reparation that needs to be happen cannot happen. We don't have conversations. Uh, so the narratives, the stories are the material that will facilitate those conversations because we cannot longer have uh, conversations based on ideas about, about politics. We need to have conversations based on the memories of those who have gone through that, through, through violence, right? So it's not ideas, but memory and experience will, will drive uh, in many ways reparation. And so, Um, to finish, I want to say, uh, I mean, again, I really want to uh, try to give you two examples and then finish, but I, I, I need to say that one of the most difficult things is to rebuild social fabric, rebuild uh, the, the, the context where victims uh, continue to exist, right? Uh, how to do that? So one of the experiments that we are doing here is really to build what a kind of community choir. So community choirs really become very um, instrumental because uh, what we're trying to do is to uh, bring together through singing and not only, not only so that we get to know each other and enjoy and etc., but where we create what I call affective spaces, spaces where people can work through their emotions and through their memories and then 
share them in the context of, for instance, these intimate, small intimate, intimate spaces. I hope that you will hear well this little video. quiero saber la verdad, porque yo también quiero saber qué pasó, porque yo también quiero saber quién lo hizo. Ya basta del silencio, ya basta del miedo, porque no nos vamos a dejar callar más, porque tenemos que hablar y gritar que queremos paz y un país para el futuro de lo que venga, que sus voces se van a escuchar en Montreal y en Colombia y en todo el mundo. Porque la guerra ya no es una opción, ya fue. Quiero agradecer, agradezco a la vida, al universo, que se hizo el proceso de paz, que se hizo esta comisión de la verdad que existe. Es un espacio de, de empatía y de sanación. En Colombia hay mucho dolor generado por la violencia, pero de los países que conozco, es el país que más irradia amor en esta tierra. So, basically, the point that I'm making is, for instance, for this choir, we meet every Tuesday. So, it's... Uh, art it cannot be something that happens once and then you disappear. There needs to be a continuity. Uh, you need a space and you need a regular um, communication with, uh, with society, uh, with, with the participants, because you, you are building community. It needs to create an open space. So this choir is an open space. People are invited every Tuesday and uh, so victims arriving from uh, Colombia, new refugees are um, invited to join us so that they can first find new people, reconnect, sing, and, um, and actually be helped and started to... We started to... <laughs> okay, so... And this is also happening with kids. Kids, the, the, the needs, there is a need for intergenerational work because victims are um, now, uh, you know, in, for instance, in, in, in exile, but the kids are born here. They don't learn about the problems that their parents went through and they need to find also spaces to talk and to hear those things. So art in this context is also enabling families to listen to each other, which is, uh, so it's not just a reparation at the level of the state or a, level, a reparation at the level of institutions. It's, re, it's a micro level reparation that needs to happen. And so we need a lot of many projects um, that need to happen in different places. So I just want to conclude, uh, you know, uh, by um, saying that, um, Even if we don't work with the wrongdoing party, we can perform reparation and reparative practices. That's what performance is about. We can actually um, work with, as the um, restorative justice center that I mentioned before does, we can bring together people who are willing to talk even if they are not the actual wrong do, uh, wrong uh, doers, right? So, for instance, uh, Phil mentioned earlier that corporates uh, actors 
don't uh, are, are probably not willing to uh, to acknowledge their their responsibility. Yeah, but some do. So we can start with some who are actually willing to work towards that and to contribute, and uh, they can be a, 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 like a symbol of what's possible. So in, in that sense, what I'm saying is uh, we can perform, we can create the conditions for people to understand and see that these kind of reparative dialogues are possible. And that's something that has started to happen in, in a number of, of projects in Colombia. Uh, Thanks, and Carlos. Can, no. can I ask you to stop sharing the screen now? And so probably we could have uh, probably 10 minutes to try to see if, uh, you know, like everyone is willing to probably jump in. Um, now that you have wrapped up uh, this very interesting presentation, um, can we can we sort of? I don't know if you would agree that uh, this kind it, of yeah yeah sounds good yeah perfect so 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 uh, Luis Carlos if 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 we could leave it like that there for a second, I would just like really like take the opportunity to probably see if we could you know we have listened to three very interesting presentations in terms of, you know, one, a general picture in terms of reparations. The other presentation has been talking about reparations in Colombia. And now Luis Carlos has shown us the power of art in order to try to look at this from the, the micro level. You know, this event is gonna, is gonna end in, the in, 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 in 13 minutes or so. So I wanted to see if we can open up the floor for some you know, comments from the people who have been sitting here, because I know that they're also, you know, experts on transitional justice or students who probably would like to jump in and leave some questions on the floor, because I don't necessarily think that we will have lots of time for answering them. But since this is a space of dialogue and we want you to also be part of this. So I, I, I guess this would be a, a good opportunity for you uh, to jump in. So if people want to talk, could you just turn your microphone on or, or give me a sign here in the chat asking me, just writing me so I can name you and you can jump in on the floor and make your comment or your question. Uh, I think Luke raised his hand and then Sabine raised her hand. Perfect. Thank you, Herman. So let's start with Luke and then Sabine and then Esther. <laughs> Hi everybody, uh, thanks for your great talks, it was uh, really, really enriching. Um, Phil, that was a great overview and I think you, you've definitely captured the, the key debates. Um, Clara, you know, I really appreciate your more upbeat um, perspective and that we you know, have to recognise the things that we have achieved and the roles like, of civil society and social movements and people inside the system as well. Um, and then Louise, um, I think it's really interesting to bring out that element of the, the interdisciplinary approach that for me, I think with you know reparations, it's, it's quite legal, and um, whereas the arts have a way of speaking to a broader audience and, and translating the sort of the obligations, the rights we're trying to do within justice reparation systems, um, to deliver and to speak to people about the wrongful actions that happened in the past. I suppose, though, my concern is that on the one hand, and this is something that uh, Phil touched on, that in a way, time is the enemy that a lot of these violations happened long ago. Colombia only really talks about violations from 85 onwards. Are we sort of overburdening the law to be able to deal with violence, which is very much part and parcel of society that has become so ingrained um, in how the social order and the economic system and the land that Clara touched upon is organized? Are we hoping or promising that reparations do too much? Um, so I think I'll leave a question there, so thanks. Thanks, Luke. Uh, Sabine. Well, hello, everybody. Um, I, have, I have questions um, about uh, around the structural reparations because both um, Phil and Clara mentioned structural reparations as something that could be thought about in the context of corporate reparations. And I was just wondering how, well, how you see this and also because Clara linked 
structural re reparations to some extent, if I understood it correctly, to, uh, also to guarantees of non-recurrence. So I was wondering how precisely do you see structural reparations, particularly in the context of corporations, but also more generally, and they're coming back to the uh, to the legal. I mean, in terms of the of, of from a legal point of view, how how would you how, how would you see them really, and, and and make a legal argument for structural reparations, or is structural reparations something where the law might actually stand in the way rather than be a help, helpful tool? Thanks, Sabine. Esther. Hi, uh, good morning or good afternoon, everybody. Um, I'm Esther Ojulari. I work for CODES, which is the Consultancy on Human Rights and Displacement in Buenaventura on the Pacific coast of Colombia. Um, and we work particularly on collective reparations and the implementation of the peace agreement. Um, so I was really, really uh, interested to hear the presentations. And I think, you know, they speak to a lot of the challenges that we face for implementing um, collective reparations. And I think one of the things that we've really noticed, I work a lot making the links between um, collective reparations in the framework of transitional justice um, and for violations in, in the armed conflict and the historic reparation, the demand by the Afro-descendant population for historic reparations for colonialism and um, enslavement. And I think one of the big challenges that we face in Buenaventura is that um, the vision of reparations from the community doesn't coincide with this, the scope of the reparations that is imagined within the decree law on reparations, which is the decree law 4635, which is an offshoot of the uh, victims law. So um, the vision of the communities that I work with are looking to address beyond 1985, as somebody just mentioned, and even beyond the scope of what is recognized as armed conflict to address those particularly underlying and structural causes of the victimization that they have experienced during the armed conflict. So that's talking about structural racism, the economic model, the port expansion in Buenaventura, and all of those other economic issues and interests. But also historically, the legacy of slavery and the fact that those communities have been left even more vulnerable to the armed conflict because of the lack of historic reparation that has never really been addressed. So, I was also very interested by what Clara was saying about uh, the fact that the scope of the domestic reparation law in terms of addressing structural, um, structural reparations and how can we really guarantee or have guarantees of non-repetition. So I wondered if Clara, maybe you could say a little bit more about that and like where should we go <laughs> for <laughs> redress if, um, if the national or the domestic, um, the domestic arena is not necessarily uh, sufficient. We also do work a lot on the PEDET, the implementation of the PEDET, and we are making a lot of links between PEDET, which is the programs for F um, with a territorial focus, because Buenaventura is a PEDET territory, um, as a structure, as a, rep as a collective reparations mechanism, a structural reparations mechanism, and also a guarantee of non-repetition. But even there, we see limits, because the economic interests of all of these big businesses are so dominating in our territory. Thank you very much, everyone, for, for uh, opening this up to wider participation. Brilliant. Thank you, Esther. We also have some questions in the chat. I'm just going to read them and then probably with the people who are still interested to listen to some of the questions. I would, I guess we could probably, if our speakers have uh, uh, some 10 extra minutes, we would like to hear a final comment ra wrapping up to the different issues that have been raised. So let me just put on the floor the other comments that have been made on the chat for, for Clara, Luis, and, and Phil uh, to, to be aware of them. There is one by Tiago Delgado, he says, how Colombians colonial past impacts the promotion of transformative justice and structural changes in Colombia? Is it possible to approach reparations and transformative justice in Colombia from the perspective of addressing colonial legacies? Then there is a question by Gwen Bonnet. Gwen is saying, to what extent are we at risk of expecting reparations to do too much? This is linked to Luke's question, probably. Do we not simply mean structural change and reform to redress interlocking systems of exclusion and inequality? So I guess this is going back precisely to these big questions that, that, that Luke was, was posing at the beginning. And then finally, Saida is writing something along the following lines. The lack of finances to fund transformative structural changes 
relies upon the elite government officials who are in essence the byproduct of liaisons of colonial rulers impose their, their power over their colonies. Do you see a way to bypass the elite politicians and structural political systems to favor investing more in these uh, transformative processes? And you know, questions keep, keep coming up. <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm just gonna read the last final two and I'm gonna ask the rest of the people to, to if they wanna share them, well, we can probably collect them and then send them around. But then the, the final two are how the inheritance of centralism affected the participation of victims at the local level. So I guess this huge discussion in Colombia that everything is drafted in Bogota and then how that you know, is having an impact at the local level. And finally, um, finally, the other question has to do with the, what is the role of alternative sanctions in transformative justice and as a form of reparation? Can we say that punishment rationale is different in transitional context and how important they will be for people that ask for accountability and recognition responsibility? And someone else is asking about the role of civil society. What is the role of civil society? So as you can see, Phil, Clara and Luis, I think you know, your presentations have created a really important sort of way of reflection. Many people who have been listening for you, to you for the last hour or so, it'd be really good to try to listen to a, you know, a general reaction from what you have heard so far in the last two hours. I will ask you to keep it to five minutes. So I'm gonna put my phone here to try to keep track of time. So Phil, over to you, five minutes, general reflections, what shall we take home? And then we'll give it to Clara and then we will give it to Luis. Hang on, you don't have microphone. Yeah, yeah, sorry. That's the, the rookie error with the technology, isn't it? The, look, I think I could do it in less than five minutes, Andre. I mean, let, let, let me maybe just pick up on um, the points raised by both Luke and Gwen, because I think they're the, the sort of big picture questions about how we think about reparations, even as a concept. Um, I mean, I, I take Gwen's question in the chat that there's a danger of lumping reparations with too many aspects of societal transformation. And I... I think in some ways, I mean, this forces me to kind of clarify my argument that I'm not suggesting that we take a sort of traditional idea of reparations and then expect it to do all of these transformative things. I think it's rather that we have to have this systematic set of mechanisms that are involved in transformation, socioeconomic, um, employment, education, housing, land, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And we need to frame those explicitly as forms of reparation. So it, 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 we, we are taking a range of interventions and being very explicit about the fact that they are designed to redress the harms of the past in this, this deep societal way. And so what that does is it, it opens us up to a much wider set of interventions and mechanisms, but, but they have to have an explicit uh, coordinated goal of redressing the harms of the past and 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 returning dignity to the victims and so i think in that sense it, it becomes more manageable and it doesn't expect reparations themselves to, to necessarily do too much it's, it's more about how we connect these things and how we describe them and i think in that sense this goes to some of the points that luke's raising about the the, the time element of all of this because I think there's also been a tendency in a, a lot of reparations debates, and, I, and look, and I think that your project at Queen's brings this out very nicely, that they've often been seen as transactional moments, that uh, especially in terms of material reparations, that um, compensation is delivered, and so the reparative process ends, rather than saying this is a long-term process that's going to need lots and lots of different interventions at different points in society. It's, it's going to take a long time. These reparations have to respond to a, a long history of violations, but the process of delivering reparations itself is, is long term. And I think what becomes important for victims there is to explain that very clearly up front. I mean, if I, if I look at a country like South Africa at the moment, I think this is part of the problem, is that reparations in many respects in the context of the TRC in the 90s was framed as this immediate delivery of material compensation to victims through the TRC, and then it was going to be game over. 
And I think what South Africa is wrestling with now is that moment has passed, but the need for reparations persists. And now it's being understood in things like land redistribution and employment and economic opportunities. Um, there's a need in that context to move past this kind of transactional understanding to something that is much longer term and, and much deeper in that sense. And one final comment, I think, just to relate to Sabine's question, I think within this understanding of reparations as multifaceted, comprehensive and longer term, there's a key role for corporate actors. I mean, I can't speak too much to the legal side because that's not my discipline, but for, from a political point of view, one of the key impediments to thinking about reparations in this structural sense, and I think someone else in the chat has raised this point, is simply how are you going to finance this? Where is the funding going to come from? Um, and there are lots of potential sources, but I think going to the, the corporate actors who themselves were so wrapped up in the violations in the first place and saying you have a, a responsibility within your own domain to finance the reparative structural work that is now necessary is, is part of your responsibility. It's part of your redress. And I think that's especially important when you account for the fact that most of the corporate actors, I mean, in a place like South Africa, just as one example, most of the corporate actors who were involved in the apartheid regime are still involved in South Africa today. They're still a massive part of the socioeconomic landscape. They've never left. They're part of those continuities from apartheid to the present, but they still continue to enrich themselves, whether it's mining companies, whether it's tech companies, whether it's banks, they're, they're all still there. In many ways, life for them hasn't changed at all. And it would be from a, a, the South African government's point of view to say, we have a structural reparative agenda and it's up to you to help us finance it. Because left to our own devices, we're simply not going to be able to, to do this. Um, and so that, that is one example of where we can start to bring corporate actors in a, in a really practical, tangible sense back into this kind of structural reparative agenda. Thanks, Phil. That's amazing. Clara, over well, to you. Two, two, two many interesting questions. Uh, I think I'm tired <laughs> to process them all. Uh, and I, I just want to say this. One thing is the law as a potential instrument for social change, but it comes with limitations. And some of the limitations, for example, with the right to reparation is that is a right that really is a right since not long ago, right? So that's why we have had problems claiming a right to reparation for slavery. Uh, and I can continue with the Dali, the Roma, uh, and so on and so forth. Uh, but having said that, I want to stress that the right reparation has given us a field for political struggle. And I think reparation is as much about a political endeavor as it is about the arts, about the law, and so on and so forth. And we cannot uh, lose hope in terms of what we have gained so far. So for example, it is not by accident that last year, finally, Congress in the United States began to have talks about reparations for slavery. Yes, I mean, that comes out as a result of a massive struggle to which the killing now in the US will add. Yes, uh, to which the fight of the Kulumani group would add, to which fights in Colombia would add. Yes, so I think we, we need to see this as a political opportunity and try to build uh, on the opportunities we have. Uh, the law is limited, but opens doors. Uh, I think the rest is down to political struggle. And I don't see, while, while I recognize that we are fighting against big powers, uh, and big powers that go beyond Colombia, it's not just the establishment, colonial establishment in Colombia. We are talking about you know, structural adjustment measures. We are talking about globalizing uh, mechanisms. We are, it, it's so many things. Uh, but still, I think uh, we are able to use the law and the opportunities it creates to try to arrive uh, to some dignity for victims and to arrive to some empowerment for victims. I think that's the only way we will be able to try and fight uh, the, the sense of inequality we have. Uh, but I don't see the right to reparation as a, as a finished game. You know, this is the game. This is it. This is, uh, I think we, we need to continue in the struggle. I work with the right to reparation because I see the opportunities it brings to the table despite the many limitations it has. Perfect. Uh, uh, no, maybe, and just to say probably to Sabine on the, on the corporate uh, side of things. Uh, I linked it to a structural because I think it's not only about responding to the violation, you, you write it yourself, it's about dealing with, with the actors that are responsible. 
And I think there are many ways to try and, and bring about some structural change. It's not all the story, but yes, with corporations. For example, uh, if they recognize responsibility, if they contribute to reparation, and if we sanction them as well, you know, as corporations that might not be able to work anymore in my country. I mean, how comes we have a steel Maricana in South Africa doing what it is doing, you know, uh, after having had apartheid? Uh, we should be able to, you know, sanction banana, Chiquita banana in Colombia for all that it has done uh, and so on and so forth. I know it's not easy. Uh, the law in that realm is evolving very slowly, but it's evolving, you know? I think we have new opportunities for change. Sorry to be optimistic about these little small windows of opportunity, but issues like remediation in relation to corporate actors and human rights are issues we need to explore and keep the fight going. I, I, I believe in fights. I don't believe in laws, but I believe in fights and in opportunities. So I think if we link uh, issues like this, we would be able to generate some adjustment that if we use properly would empower people who have been uh, excluded, discriminated against, uh, and so on. But, but I know it's difficult, but there are many fighting. Amazing. Thank you so much, Clara. Luis Carlos, over to you. Well, thank you. Um, I, I see one of the questions is how could civil society can help victims processes? And um, I want to highlight again that in my view, it's not only, um, it's not only that law is perhaps not enough. So it's not only that transitional justice institutions are overwhelmed and are not enough. It's also that sometimes law and even restorative justice principles are not necessarily well equipped to facilitate the type of intimate deep listening that needs to happen for a number of re reparative processes to really take place. Because uh, again, it's not necessarily or it's not primarily about money. It's more about a number of very deep um, impacts on families, on communities, on friendships. So for instance, here, I have uh, heard from uh, victims who said, who said to me, I don't want to give my testimony to the Truth Commission because um, in many ways, I am more uh, in pain because of how my own friends behaved to, with me when I was the victim than I am with the perpetrators. So it's a very complex process because um, uh, it is, so you don't understand reparation if you don't understand the harm. And you don't understand the harm if you don't listen. It's as simple as that. So the big question is, how do we go about developing better strategies to listen effectively to people's uh, harms and problems and needs when what it's at stake, what it's actually happening is a continuing silencing process. A silencing process is within families, for instance. So I have heard here families who need 10 years to be in exile, to be then finally ready to open up their hearts and talk with others about what happens to them. It takes a lot of time. Victims of sexual violence, it takes a lot of time to talk about their problems. So unless we create spaces for intimacy, to build trust, for listening, even if that doesn't take to official reparations, but if that takes to actual civil society reparations, that is uh, something where the arts has something to do and where civil society can also contribute as, as people who listen uh, and engage with these narratives respectfully. Thanks, Luis. That's, that's amazing. I would like to try to bring this very incredible and enriching panel to a close by offering sort of three conclusions that come to my mind after listening to you. Um, I think, and, 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 and I'm gonna start with the final thing that Luis has said, because it's really the DNA of Rodemos el Dialogo or Embrace Dialogue. Uh, we, we do believe that 
in, in, in terms of trying to help healing for a society that has been traumatized by war, what we need to do is to build a culture of dialogue that defeats what I'm gonna call now structural silences. Because perhaps uh, I think what, what Luis has been telling us is very important in, in the sense that we feel that in informal spaces uh, in Colombia and in many of the societies that have been going through war, silence remains as one of the biggest obstacles that do not allow to start thinking about how to share the suffering that people went through, even in the private space, in the more intimate space. And the other thing, if it doesn't happen in the intimate space, then outside becomes a performance, a performance that doesn't heal necessarily because it's not healing in, in, in the individuals. So I think that the big, big, big thing that I'm taking for, from here, the first big thing is, of course, reparations are important, but many of the important healing that is gonna happen is gonna happen outside the formal proceedings that have been created by transitional justice. And civil society can play a role by promoting this culture of dialogue, these spaces of trust. And I think we've been learning that in Rodemos el Dialogo since 2012, when we started these spaces like today, in which we do active listening to try to reevaluate our own prejudices and try to think creative ways of dealing and also to, to, you know, to listen to the victims. The second important thing that I'm taking from here is I think that very key message that, um, that uh, Clara has shared with us and is that reparations is not only a legal category, but is a field of political struggle. And I think that's absolutely essential. Clara has said that many times. And I think the other thing that is so important in what Clara has been saying is that we must not confuse uh, the reparations as what is gonna create a better society as such. It's just like when we think about Taoism uh, and we think about the Zen masters and we say that the Zen masters are showing us with the finger where is the moon and you try to go in that direction, but you cannot confuse the finger with the moon. The moon is elsewhere. So reparations is where we are going to, but we will never get there. This is a long, long-term process that is trying to reshape society. The next generations to have different opportunities of interactions to try to transform the structural inequalities upon which humanity has evolved. So I think that's the reason why Clara is so optimistic. And I think we need to keep that sense of these reparations as a field of political struggle towards a place that we probably never reach, but that bring us hope of moving in a different direction. And finally, the final thing that I take from here is from Phil Clark. And I think Phil, thank you so much for your comments and you know, just putting the questions in terms of a scope, you know, the different scopes and bringing like these different levels in which the discussions about reparations are taking place now and bringing colonialism, bringing corporate responsibilities because one of the main problems that we have in Colombia, and this is for me so important now, is because you are showing us that we are not unique. You know, that we, in Colombia, there is a, a tendency to believe that we are the center of the universe. We, we, we love, you know, looking ourselves to our belly and think, yes, we are. The, but actually, we're in the middle of a macro level process in which many different societies who have suffered structural inequalities, in some cases through war, in some cases not necessarily through war, the legacies of war, of unequal systems, they're still struggling to try to transform the reality that they have to live in. And they have, you know, and these discussions are happening to the framework of reparations. So thank you for showing us that we are not unique and that this is a learning process in which we are connected to other things that are happening in the world. So I hope that all of you enjoy this panel. In Rodemos el Dialogo, we usually ask people to turn on the cameras at the end of the session and to open their microphones 
to do a gesture of a symbolic gesture of um, gratefulness and thank and, and thank our speakers. So if you are so kind to turn on your cameras now and to open your microphones, I would like to ask you to offer a huge clap to our speakers and to you for being here for the last two and a half hours talking about reparations. Thank you, thank you so much. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Gracias, thank you. Brilliant. Gracias. Gracias. Thanks everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.